Criminally underrated is a phrase that perfectly sums up ASCII's Melfin stories for the SNES. I never hear anyone mention this game when talking about the system, most likely due to it never leaving Japan, but it seems like even most importers don't know about it, and that's an absolute shame as it is one hell of a fine side-scrolling beat-em-up, and it goes to show that there is still a never-ending slew of amazing games for the Super NES just waiting to be discovered. The story revolves around our four heroes, L, Course, Lemon, and Nina, going to save Melfinland from the evil tyranny of Namawa, who has seized the throne with his army of mystical creatures and soldiers. Only you, or you and a friend, can stop his villainous wrath. Before diving into the controls, let's talk about each of the four characters' different attributes. First up is the skilled fighter, L, who is the all-around even character with a medium attack, medium speed, medium armor, and medium range. Next up is the Knight Course, who is this game's tank with his strong attack, slow speed, strong armor, and short range. Next is the Witch Lemon. She's the exact opposite. She has a weak attack, fast speed, weak armor, but the longest range. And last but not least is Simon Belmont, I mean Nina, a thief who has a medium attack, fast speed, weak armor, and long range. Funny enough with how this game works, the two extremes, Lemon and Course, are the two that make the game the easiest, since Course can take a lot of damage and deal just as much back, and Lemon can usually stay a safe distance from most enemies while she pelts them with magic. That's not to say Nina isn't a force to be reckoned with, as she too has speed and range, but as for L, he doesn't quite cut it with his short range and medium armor. As far as controls go, Y is your go-to attack button, X is used to cast magic when you have it, and B jumps. Holding down Y will block. Besides attack, this is the most useful command in the game. Although, since attack and block are mapped to the same button, you may find yourself blocking when trying to attack, or vice versa. Pressing up and Y is a fast turnaround attack to help you keep enemies from the front and back at bay. This is also a great move to use on enemies that block. Pressing down and B will do a slide, which I never really used and is only needed to get past a certain spot in the cave level, but, for slower characters, it might be useful to quickly get them out of harm's way. And while jumping, you can press down and do a sick-ass flip! This has no function in the game outside of looking rad as fuck. The gameplay is marvelous. It may look pretty average, but it feels good in that Castlevania kind of way. I know the two games are pretty different, but I can't help but make the comparison, especially when playing as Nina, whipping enemies left and right. The two become even more comparable if Nina ends up at the church level, fending off ghouls, skeletons, bats, and rock golems. Comparisons aside, the controls are spot on. From hacking your way through goblins and harpies, to desecrating the kraken and slaying a dragon, the feeling of high fantasy never ceases. And thanks to the excellent controls, making your way through Melfinland is always an adventure worth taking, especially if you want to see all the game has to offer. That's right, there are multiple paths for you to venture through, four in total. You have the easy path, the hard path, and the two that are a mixture of both easy and hard stages. Each path offers different stages, bosses, and enemies, so if you want to see the dragon, then you better pick the route that leads to the cave. Or if you want to ride a giant bird while fighting a flying skeleton, then you better take the path that leads to the giant bird flying skeleton battle. Paths do cross over from time to time, but no one path takes you to every level. Besides affecting bosses and stages, different paths affect the story, too. For example, if you take the path that leads to the church where you help the priestess, she'll show up to help you during the final boss. If you wind up at the mountain stage, she'll save a girl who ends up becoming the princess in one of the character's endings. And my favorite detail is depending on the route you take, the final stage will be different as each route leads you into the castle via a different entrance. 
Levels, while basic in design, as there's no platforming to be done, just move to the right and fight, are still great backdrops to an epic adventure. The emerald glow of the grass plains, the dark and foreboding dwellings of the forest, and the dusky summit of the mountain are just a few examples. While there may not be any platforming, occasionally stages will have small hazards like the holes you can fall into in the grass plains, the pits of deadly quicksand in the forest, and they even pull a splatterhouse on you with a hall of mirrors. Levels typically keep a varied palette of bright and pastel colors to fit with the cutesy SD style that I oh so love, making sure levels hardly ever feel drab. Even the town level where 90% of the scenery is bronze or brown has some nice hues of purple and blue in the sky and on the castle in the distance to halt an almost sepia toned palette. While this game far from pushes the SNES's capabilities, some parallax scrolling and a few other cool effects show up from time to time. Look, there's even some shoehorned mode 7 in one of the minigames. The enemies that inhabit each stage are not only diverse in type, but in attack too. You have your typical creatures like the goblins that simply walk at you, while foes like the lizard men and soldiers are a bit smarter in block. Other enemies like the little devils can mess up your controls upon contact, and others are just downright weird like these Game & Watch type things. Of course, there's no shortage of annoying enemies either, such as the blobs that stun you in place and deal a ton of damage, the axe throwing knights, and the worst has to be the gargoyles in the church level that are a pain in the ass to hit as they just fly all over the place. Each stage garnishes two bosses which are easily the highlight of every level. Plenty of classic creatures are represented, like the wyvern, the griffin, hellhounds, a cyclops, and dune worms, or I guess sand worms as the game puts it. Most boss patterns can be learned pretty quickly, but some are more difficult, especially with certain characters. Thankfully, you can find magic and chests throughout levels to even out the playing field. There are three different spells, wind, fire, and lightning. There are a few catches. Magic is one use per pickup. When you die, you lose all of your magic, so if you're low on health, it's best to cast it before it's too late. And you lose it when you complete a level, so if you're on a stage's end boss and still have a spell, use it. Also, wind and fire magic make the final boss a total pushover. There's even a chest right there waiting for you, and if executed in the right place, can kill him in one hit. But of course, you have to get there first. And with only four lives, it proves to be an arduous journey. This is where points come into play. With every 20,000 points, you earn an extra life or continue as the game considers it. So all of those gold pieces and necklaces you found along the way do serve a purpose. Additional help comes in the form of mini games, of which there are two. Not only are they a good source of points, but they break up the gameplay for a bit. The downside of all of your hard work is that if you die, your points reset, and you can't have more than five continues, which is ridiculous as points mean nothing once you've accumulated all five. There are a fair amount of cutscenes throughout, which mostly happen right before or after boss fights. If only I could understand what is going on, this game could be even better. Regardless, you can kind of piece together what is being said based on the boss and the scenery. For the time, there are even a few cutscenes that are kind of cinematic, like this one during the Gollum boss fight. I guess you could say, this scene rocks. Keeping in line with the rest of the game, the music is adventurous in that sword and sorcery kind of way, with lots of flutes and brass instruments playing medieval melodies. All tracks do a great job of setting the stage. The forest levels sound dark and mysterious, the castle music is very symphonic and apprehensive, and the church level's use of the pipe organ is ominous, yet rapturous. The standout tracks are the church, the green plains, and the final boss music. All in all, the soundtrack is appropriate and fits the game perfectly, although it is somewhat forgettable from time to time. While not being able to get more than five continues is certainly a downer, I think the game's biggest fault is not being able to switch between the four different characters on the fly. That would have made the game's strategy all the more interesting as there are certain sections and bosses that are made easier with different characters. For example, the final stretch of the castle on one path is a piece of cake with Lemon as she can take care of these suits of armor with her long range while everyone else has to deal with close combat. Of course, being so strong makes the mountain level less of an uphill battle, and Nina with her speed and range makes quick work of the dune worms. 
Now, you are completely stuck with one character for the whole game, as you do get the choice to switch upon continuing, but it's not worth purposely dying to switch to another character just for a certain section. This in no way damns the game, as it presents you with the challenge of mastering it with each character, but it could have changed the game's dynamic with an even more strategic approach. Melvin's Stories is simply an amazing game. The controls are finely crafted, the levels are scenic, the gameplay is solid, and with its multiple paths, multiple characters, and multiple endings, the replayability is very high. It has tons of charm that make the experience all the more pleasurable, like the little character portraits that react to being hit or dying, and tons of strategy in finding which route best suits each character. Plus, it supports two players. In a way, it's almost the Golden Axe experience, but on the Super Famicom. The game is kind of rare and goes for around $40 loose, which is about how much I got my copy for, and in box it's about $100. But believe me, the game is worth what it commands, so spend some gold and go on a glorious adventure with Melvin Stories.